This lesson is get data from a database using the entity framework. The objectives for this lesson are to add the entity framework to your project, add data annotations to the product class, create a DB context class to read data from SQL Server. We're then going to read data from a product table to replace the hard coded data we have currently. To get the entity framework, we install a package into our Web API project using NuGet. The package is called Microsoft.EntityFrameworkCore.SQLServer. We're going to add some data annotations to our product class and decorate the properties in there with things like table, key, required, and other data annotations. We're going to create a DB context class for interacting with SQL Server tables. And of course, we need a connection string, so we'll add that to our app settings file. Let's take a look at how to add the entity framework to our project. Let's take out the security that we added in the last lesson, just so we don't have to worry about logging in each time. So let's go ahead and comment this out. And that way we're back to just where we were before. And if we wanted to, we could actually go into the extension classes and we could remove all of that configuration for the open API if we wanted, but that's not gonna hurt anything. So we'll just leave that for now. But feel free to remove that if you don't wanna see those little locks. All right, let's go ahead, right mouse click on our project and choose Manage NuGet Packages. Go to Browse and type in Microsoft.EntityFrameworkCore.SQLServer. Once you locate that package, install the latest version. And it should ask us if we want to accept all these different license terms. Just go ahead and click on Accept. So there we have the Entity Framework now installed into our project. The next step is to now add data annotations to our product class to help it align with the fields in our SQL Server table. I'm going to be using the AdventureWorks Lite database, which is a sample database that Microsoft put out many years ago. And you can download this on my GitHub, and I'll give you a link to that. But let's go ahead and right mouse click on the product table because this is the table that we're gonna model. And in fact, if you look at this, this looks like all the properties that we have in our product class. So we have the same type of data types, whether or not they allow nulls or not. It has these different data types, like a money data type. We have a weight as a decimal eight comma two. So there's lots of things that we use to match up the properties in our class to the fields here in this table. Open up the product class. So we need a lot of information here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna completely replace the code here and then we'll go through everything that I added. So if we take a look up here at the beginning, I've added a couple of using statements to go out to the system.componentmodel.data annotations and the data annotations.schema. Line six, we add a table attribute we put the table name and the schema name in, into which that table is located. Then if we start down here with line 17, you can see I've added a data annotation required, key, and database generated to the product ID property. The reason why is because that is our primary key and it uses identity to increment that value each time. I've got some other things here. I've got a required on the name, a required on the product number, required on standard cost. And then look at what I've done here for the column attribute on standard cost. I put the type name and I said it's a decimal 18 comma two because that's what a money data type translates to. And I did that for the list price and I did it for the weight as well. And then the other thing I did here is if you look down on line 42, I have column row good. That's the actual all lowercase name of that column in that table. But I like having all of my properties start with an uppercase letter. So I'm using that column to actually remap my property to the actual column name. Now that we've annotated the product class, we need to inherit from Entity Framework's DB context class. This is what helps us interact with our tables. We map our entities and our relationships to tables in our database. And we use this DB context class for all of our CRUD logic. 
We create a DB set property within this class for each table in our database that we want to interact with. So you do something like public DB set product, and then you give it a name, products, and it's just a normal property. So you add your get and your set. This DB set property, products, for instance, or customers, is what we interact with to add, edit, and delete rows in that table. Let's go ahead and add our DB context class now. In your project, right mouse click on the project and choose Add New Folder. And we'll create a new folder called Models. Right mouse click on that folder, add a class. And this class will be called AdventureWorks LTDB Context. Now, the code we're going to put into here, if you can see on line eight, we inherit from the DB Context class. That's part of Microsoft's Entity Framework. We have a constructor here into which is injected DB context objects, AdventureWorks Lite DB context options, and we pass those options to the base class. So it does some things with these options, and we'll see this when we set it up in dependency injection. And then I just have the one product class that I'm using right now. So I create my public DB set products property. And then there is this on model creating, there's this model builder. We're not going to do anything with it right now. We, I don't think we actually need anything for this course, but sometimes you might need this particular override. So I'd recommend just put it in there. That way you'll know it's there and you'll know what to do with it later. Now let's go ahead and open up our app settings.development.json and let's add a connection string. We're going to call it default connection. And now I'm using my local SQL Server here. So server equals localhost, database equals AdventureWorks LT. The trusted connection is true. Multiple active results sets is true. I'm going to trust my server certificate. And then I put in an application name. So you'll want to change this to match whatever you're using for your appropriate connection string. Now we're ready to add that DB context to our dependency injection services so that we can inject it into our repository or other classes that may need it. Open the service extensions class and add two more using statements, AdventureWorks API.models and Microsoft Entity Framework Core. Then we're gonna add a new method down here. And again, it's part of this services collection. We're going to call it Configure AdventureWorks DB. So you can see what's being passed in is the services collection, right? Because this is an extension method. And then the connection string. So then we return services.addbcontext, AdventureWorks Lite DB context. The options are to use SQL Server. And then you pass that connection string. This is what gets passed to that constructor as those options. Once we have this, let's open up our program.cs. And right after configuring the global settings, let's add and configure this AdventureWorks Lite DB context by making that call into the new method that we just added there. And then here you can see what I'm doing. builder.services.configureAdventureWorksDB, passing in builder.configuration.getConnectionString. So it knows how to go get a connection string. Okay, now, if it doesn't find it, I'm just going to pass an empty string. But now we've got this participating in dependency injection services. Our DB context is now ready to be used from other classes that need it. So now it's time to change our product repository to get products from a database as opposed to that hard coded list. Open up the product repository and let's add a private field. Private read only AdventureWorks Lite DB context underscore DB context. And let's add a constructor into which it will inject that AdventureWorks Lite DB context. Now, what we can do is we can go down here to the get method. This is where all of those hard coded values are located. And we're going to replace this with the following one line return underscore DB context dot products. Remember that products DB set that we added. And I'm going to apply an order by, and I'm going to order by the product name. I convert that to a list, and that's what gives us back our list of products. So let's give this a try. If we were to save all these changes we made and we run the application, 
Once this comes up, go down to Get API Product, try it out, execute. It is now going out to the SQL Server to grab that product data, and it's going to now give us back all the data from our SQL Server. Let's go change the other method now in the product repository, the one that gets a single product from the database. Under the get ID method here, we don't want to go get all the products and then apply a where. That's actually very wasteful. What we want to do is use our dbcontext.products.where, and in the where clause, we tell it that we want to search on the product ID is equal to the ID that's passed in. This sends the appropriate SQL statement down to SQL Server that basically is select asterisk from product where product ID is equal to this ID that we passed in. So much more efficient than going out and getting all of them and then filtering on the client side. So now that we have that, let's go ahead and run this again. Come down to the one that says we're asking for an ID. Type in a valid ID, execute. And there is our product information for that one product now. Now that we have the repository that has the DB context that's being injected, we need to change our router class because when we're using DB context, you do not want to pass it to our router classes constructor. The reason why is that router class is created one time at the beginning of the program. We don't want our DB context to be created a single time. We want different instances of DB context. That'll give us the best performance and avoid any concurrency issues with multiple users coming in at the same time. So we're going to change our router class to inject each I repository object into each method. So let's take a look at now using method injection instead of constructor injection. Open the product router.cs file and remove in the constructor the I repository product underscore repo. Also remove line 13, which is setting that to our private read only, which we're also going to eliminate. I'm going to go ahead and copy this right now. And then what we're going to do is we're going to come down here into each one of our methods. What we want to do is pass in our repo here, right, our I repository into each individual method. So we're just going to take this, add each one here, and then we need to pass that repository object that we're getting from dependency injection to each one of those methods. So let's go ahead and we'll come down here and we'll locate each one of these methods, right? So here is the first one, this get here. And we'll simply change this to now, instead of using that one that was a private read only for the whole class, we're now going to just use our local one here and also our local one here as well. So just a couple of little changes. And now when we run this, we should get the exact same results, but we're now being much more efficient. And like I said, we're really just avoiding any concurrency issues with multiple users coming in. This also helps us take advantage of object pooling. So in this lesson, we added the entity framework and placed it into our dependency injection services container. We created a DB context class that helps us read from SQL Server, and we returned data from the product table in SQL Server. Coming up next, we're gonna add, edit, delete, and validate data in our SQL Server tables.